We are really happy to have Marina Bedney uh, visiting us. Uh, Marina got her undergrad degree in John, at Johns Hopkins, uh, followed by a um, PhD at University of Pennsylvania, um, after which she went to two postdoc degrees in, at, at Harvard Medical School and then MIT, before going back to Johns Hopkins uh, to become an assistant professor um, and now an associate professor. Marina is working on really, um, really creative uh, sort of part, part, part of um, of research where she's looking at um, people who are born blind, people who lost their sight uh, later in life and comparing them to sighted individuals. Um, and she's able to pinpoint what happens to the visual cortex when um, you know it's not being used either from the very beginning of life or uh, later on. Um, so she, she has really a, a line of research that is super creative and I'm really excited to um, have her tell us about it. So Marina, without further ado, take it on. Thank you so much. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, yes, great. Um, thank you, Joe Vermeer, for inviting me and thank you all for having me here. I'm really excited to be here to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing for the past little while. Um, I invite you to ask questions at any point. I tend to overpack my talks with too much data, but I don't actually feel compelled to tell you about all of it. <laughs> so if there's something that you um, want to talk about or just follow up on, please just interrupt and we can have a conversation about it. Um, so today I want to tell you a little bit about um, in, insights into nature nurture questions from blindness and a little bit about cultural skills, but mostly about blindness. Um, my uh, research and the research of our lab is motivated by um, understanding how experience shapes um, cognition and development. Um, so what are the contributions of uh, innate predispositions as opposed to experience to the way our mind works? And one of the ways that I think about this problem is that what makes people um, special is not only how smart we are, but how adaptable we are. So we have populated the world. We live um, everywhere um, in deserts, in rainforests, um, uh, in uh, freezing climates. Um, we in, even within a single society, there's a lot of variation in the kinds of things that we do, whether we learn to program computers um, or uh, become politicians uh, or build houses, right? So we have a lot of adaptability and specialization. So I'm interested in the question of how we learn from experience and what makes the human brain um, and the human mind so adaptable and so good at learning. Um, so the way that I'm gonna, uh, the way that I approach this problem is by comparing um, cognition and brain um, function in populations with different developmental histories. Um, the data that I'm gonna tell you about today come from um, uh, primarily studies with people who are born blind, um, a little bit of data from people who became blind as adults. Um, but the lab works on uh, with different kinds of populations. Um, so I have, I was telling someone, uh, oh, he's not here, but anyway, um, I have one student who's interested in computer programming. So how the brain learns to program and so he compares the brains of people with different levels of programming expertise. Um, we're now interested in um, deafness and how people um, acquire different kinds of languages, including not only auditory languages, but also visual manual languages, like sign languages, like American Sign Language. So the, the lab is generally interested in um, plurality of experience and how our brain adapts to that. Um, but today I'm gonna focus on work with uh, people who are born blind because um, this is the kind of the population we've, we've worked with the most um, over the years. So before I get, um, uh, into talking about this, I want to tell you about why we might want to work with people who are blind um, if we're interested in neuroscience, and then tell you a little bit about the population. Um, so blindness can tell us about um, a number of interesting questions. So of course, 
vision is an important sense for primates, um, including humans, for learning about the world. So we use vision to recognize people by looking at their faces. We use vision to navigate. Um, we use vision to learn about objects, social interaction, basically everything. And so the question is, how does the mind develop um, in cases where we don't have visual access? So how do we learn through other modalities? What are the things um, that are available or different um, in that context? So that's a cognitive question. And I'm actually not gonna talk about it too much. I'll talk about it a little in the very beginning. Um, but then the second question that I'm interested in is um, related to brain development, right? So in people, a very large part of our brain um, uh, is thought to have evolved for visual perception, right? So if you ask a vision scientist, they might tell you it's a quarter of, your, of um, the brain. If you ask you know, some out of sensory scientists, maybe they'll say it, it's a fifth, but it's a very large, <laughs> part of the brain um, that does various kinds of visual functions like color perception, um, uh, fine grain, spatial discrimination, face perception. And the question is, what happens to this part of the brain when it doesn't get its species typical input, right? The kind of visual um, experience that we think our brain has evolved to expect. Um, what kinds of functions do they, does it take on? Are these functions similar to vision, which would suggest perhaps strong innate constraints on what cortical territory can do in people, or are they quite different from vision and what can that tell us about um, the constraints placed on the system? So that those are the two questions I'm gonna focus on. I'll mostly talk about the second one, starting with the first, but let's start by thinking about the population of people that we're working with. So most of the work that I'll tell you about is with people who are born blind. Um, so these are individuals who have at most uh, minimal light perception since birth, so they don't use vision to navigate, to identify objects, to read, to see people. Um, and these are individuals who are born with the level of vision that they have now, so they have never had um, form perception or movement perception through their vision. The blindness is due to some uh, pathology of the optic nerve or eyes, right? So since we're interested in the development of cognition and brain function, we're focusing on a, um, a population of people who are blind whose blindness is not due to brain damage, but rather um, due to a pathology of the optic nerve or eyes. Um, it's a varied pool of participants with different kinds of causes of blindness. So some of the participants are blind due to retinopathy or prematurity um, because of being born early. Some of the participants have congenital, um, Lieber's congenital amaurosis, which is a genetic condition of the eyes. There are people with microanthalmia or anophthalmia, so either having eyes that are small and non-functioning or no being born without eyes at all um, for reasons that are unknown. Um, so it's a heterogeneous pool of people from the perspective of why their eyes are broken um, or not functioning. And, and, but the common factor is these individuals um, their retinas are not receiving visual information. Um, these individuals are have no cognitive or neurological disabilities. So we interview people in detail about their cognitive history so that they, they've never had a diagnosis of any cognitive disability. We also administer standardized cognitive tasks in the lab, including the Braille Woodcock Johnson, which measures um, you know, analogies, synonym kinds of reasonings, vocabulary, reading um, in Braille, math, working memory. Um, so we know that the participants who are taking part in our studies are typically developing people who are just um, growing up without visual access. Um, and then we compare um, brain function and behavior in these people to sighted controls who are um, blindfolded during the experiment. So the partic sighted participants in the fMRI experiments and also in the behavioral experiments, they're wearing light exclusion blindfolds. So that means what we're measuring is the consequence of the history of absence of vision rather than current um, lack of access to vision because everybody is blindfolded in the experiment. Okay? Okay, and the participants are age and education matched. And then towards the end, I'll say something a little bit about adult onset blindness. Okay, are there any questions about participants? Okay, good. Um, so the first thing I wanna tell you is that neuroscientists are definitely not the first people to think about blindness um, and what we can learn from blindness about the mind. 
Um, the first people actually to think about this problem were philosophers. Um, and actually in many cultures across the world, philosophers have thought about well, what is the mind of a blind person like if they've never seen anything? Um, this particular quote is from John Locke, um, who was a British empiricist. And he thought that because people who are blind cannot have visual access to the world, there are some ideas, um, like here he's talking about the idea of rainbow, but also things like sparkle and yellow that would be fundamentally inaccessible to a blind person. And by ideas, what this person, what um, Locke meant was, concepts right so he thought everything in our mind is built up of sensory experience if you're missing this fundamental sensory experience then visual concepts are inaccessible to you um and then in the 80s psychologists like barbara lando and lila gleitman started to conduct empirical experiments with um blind children to understand well what of um, this kind of idea. Is it really the case that people who are blind are lacking in some of these visual kinds of concepts? Um, and so I'm going to tell you just one example of our work from this line of research. Um, we've done research um, following up on this um, in um, on color knowledge, on knowledge of visual events like sparkling um, and glowing. Um, but I'm going to only tell you like a little example because I want to also get to the brain data, which I think is a little more maybe relevant um, here. So this is a recent project um, that's being done by a graduate student, um, uh, Zuan Wang, um, in, our, in, in our lab um, in collaboration with a former postdoc, Lisa Muzz. And here we're um, asking what people who are blind know about how visual perception works, right? Um, so, you know, here you're looking at a picture of this woman, she's walking down um, uh, in a train station and she glances back. And based on this image, you might have some ideas about what it is that she knows. What does she know based on her glance? Does she know that there's a man behind her? Does she know that he's wearing a hat? Does she know the color of his eyes? Um, what does she know about his appearance based on this brief glance as she's walking down um, uh, uh, the platform? And so what we asked in this experiment is, what do people who are blind know about how much and what kinds of things are visible based on uh, visual perception? And of course, because these are uh, people who are blind, we're not going to show them pictures. We um, transform everything into verbal scenarios. So people who are blind and people who are sighted get scenarios like Sarah is a sighted adult. She was walking to the grocery store and walked past a brick row home that was right up against the sidewalk. A person was sitting on the front stoop of the row home. Sarah glanced at this person as she walked by them and then kept going. Based on what she saw, how likely is Sarah to know whether this person um, uh, was smiling or frowning? And then we ask a variety of questions. Was 30 or 60 years old? Was feeling happy, sad, or neutral? Um, is someone she met before? Was wearing a hat or not? Um, has light blue or dark brown eyes, right? So we ask um, all our participants to rate on a scale of one to seven, how likely an observer is to know this information based on this glance. Um, and then we manipulate various things about the story as well, which I'll tell you in a second. And then of course we have a control condition where we ask about um, an analogous hearing scenario where the person is talking and you hear them say something and then based on their voice, what do you know about them? Okay, um, so here I'm showing you data from a group of, um, uh, I believe this was um, 22 um, blind and 22 uh, sighted participants um, across the individual questions. So for some of the questions, like for example, whether the person is feeling um, uh, happy, sad, or neutral, people say they, they, you might know um, based on how that web you know, how that person is feeling. But then for, for some other things, like whether they're wearing a hat based on vision, they would say, yeah, they're very likely to know that, right? So for a visual scenario. Um, so the first thing, and each of the numbers on this graph is one of the questions, right? So a high correlation between groups means that the um, two groups, the blind and the sighted people, found the same things to be highly perceptible and uh, versus other things to be hard to perceive. So the upper side of the graph is a high rating, the lower side of the graph is a low rating, and consistency between a groups gives you a high correlation. In this case, the, the, um, the row is 0.93. So at least for the hearing scenarios, the groups are in high agreement about what are the kinds of things that are easy to know based on hearing and what are the things that are hard. 
Um, and what's interesting is that the correlation is also extremely high um, for the visual scenarios. So blind and sighted people are in high agreement as to which things are easy to see and which things are hard to see, right? Um, so this is kind of interesting. Um, it seems like we have an intuitive idea about what these things are. And then in other analyses that we've done, it looks like there are various kinds of factors that influence um, whether you think something is easy to see. One factor, of course, is object size. So people who are blind and sighted um, have similar intuition about how likely something is to, to be able to be visible, um, depending on the size of the object. Um, the other thing that we looked at is we manipulated in the stories is the brevity or the duration of the event. Um, so whether the person glanced or stared, right? So if they're staring, it's for a longer time. And also how close they were to the object they were looking at. So did they walk just past it and it was um, right next to them? Or was it on the other side of the street? And we now repeated this experiment, not just with the other side of the street, but a block away. Yeah. Back for a uh, seems like seven was. Uh, yeah, it seems like seven, seven was. Yeah, out. Like, do you have some that are? Is there something particular about some questions? Is, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, if I remember correctly, that one is voice. Um, and whether the person is able to tell the identity of the person. So this is a that one is a hearing case. Um, and I think what it looks like is that blind people have a lower rating for that item. I, we, we now have a new sample of data and I actually don't know if that particular, I have to look and see if it replicates, but it's kind of interesting, right? So in that scenario, you might imagine that blind people actually have to identify people based on their voice more often than sighted people. And so they might have a better insight into how easy or hard that is. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sorry for my no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I think so. Um, I guess what first there's obviously some differences between hearing and the seeing component, but more like are there are some of these differences much more consistent in the types of the type of question? Do the certain questions deviate more or less from the I guess here it doesn't look like it from the trend line? Um, yeah, not really, right? So so far, I mean, we tried when we designed the items to pick things where we thought people would have consistent intuitions. And actually, I mean, something interesting is that if you just take two groups of sighted people, they are in amazing agreement. I've never seen correlations this high in my life. Um, like it's 0.98 um, across two groups of sighted subjects. So I mean, that's another interesting thing, which is that we have some intuitive theories of perception in our mind um, that we all form. And one hypothesis is that we form those theories based on our own visual observation. But I guess what these data suggest is that that's not the only way to do that, right? So you can also form these theories just by talking to people through natural conversation um, and getting feedback. Um, so the other thing that we manipulated is how, um, how far the observer is and how long they're looking. Um, so this is time, so the duration of looking and the distance. And we, we were asking whether sighted and blind people would agree that as things get further, they're harder to see. And as you look longer, you're more likely to see something. Um, and so I'll just, so, so this is, these data I'm showing you is a different score between um, uh, far away and close, as well as um, extended and brief cases of looking. So bars that are above zero mean that, um, so for distance, the closer something is, the more likely you're, you're rating it to be seen. And then for time, the longer you look, the more likely it is um, to be seen. And so for seeing scenarios, um, what you actually find is that both blind and sighted people have the same intuition that, the closer you get, the more likely you are to see something, and the longer you look, the more likely you are to see something. But the weighting of those two factors are different. So blind people actually weight distance less than duration. And we've now replicated this in a new set of data where it seems that although blind people also have the intuition that things get harder to see as they get far away, that curve is flatter for them than for sighted people. They um, Their intuition in these scenarios is that you can see further than sighted people estimate that you can see. So the way that we're thinking about this right now, and basically you don't get this for hearing scenarios, so I'm gonna skip over it. The way that we're thinking about this right now is that you can get 
the, um, you know, if you have mental equations about um, the effect of distance on visibility and size on visibility and duration of visibility, um, these equations um, can be um, constructed mentally just by talking to people. You don't actually have to see yourself, but the perceptual experience scales the factors. So if you have your own visual experience of looking at things, then you can um, you use that to adjust how far you think an average person can see. And for blind and sighted people, that kind of experience is different. So that's the way we're thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering whether or not there were other factors that contributed to some of the differences that you see, like age or gender or anything like that. Um, they're matched on age and gender. Okay. And I, I know level. that the, the control, like the controls are matched, but um, like within the group, there's some variability, right? Within the sighted group and within the control group. And so I was just curious whether or not, That's you know, any of that variability might map onto another factor. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so one of the things I mentioned is that the, the correlations are quite high across groups in general, but we we have done other, you know, the analysis I'm showing you here is just two groups to each other. We also do a leave one person out kinds of analyses or coherence analyses to see how much agreement there is. Um, so we could use those to test predictions about, you know, what other individual variables might affect um, agreement. Um, do you have some thoughts about what, I mean, so one thought, we, one thing we've thought about is among the sighted population, there are actually obviously different levels of visual acuity. So you could imagine that part of the way you estimate other people's perception is based on your own. So you, that, that, um, I don't know that we have enough variability in our sample to detect that right now, but do you have other, I didn't, I didn't no, you're I just, just saw, wondering. I just saw yeah. the variability within the group. Mm. Mm. all of for this, yeah, 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 yeah. You mean for the distance and time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that we could look at that, but I don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. So the reason that I bring up this study very briefly um, is as, as a sample of the kind of information that people who are blind know that as a sighted person, you might not think they would. <laughs> so basically people who are sighted um, have a with strong intuition about vision is an important source of information. But in fact, in all the experiments that we've done on color, on light, on visual perception, um, it turns out that people who are blind and sighted share a lot of common knowledge that we think of as visual, right? Um, and so the question of course is why? Um, and one uh, idea is that, you know, we are using language to communicate and construct intuitive theories of perception and not only blind people, but sighted people are doing that. So people who are blind are arriving. We, we think we learn everything from perception, but in fact, we learn most of what we learn by talking to people, <laughs> right? Um, so that's one idea behind why people who are blind have this exquisitely preserved knowledge of domains that are um, that are visual. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears um, and talk about plasticity in the visual system, right? So what I wanna talk to you about now is what happens to the part of the brain that evolved for visual perception or putatively evolved for visual perception in people who are blind. Um, People have been thinking about this question for a long time. It's been studied since, you know, functional neuroimaging has been around. Um, and the dominant idea in this field has been that the visual, so the, the initial thought, right, um, was maybe this part of the brain will atrophy, right? Maybe it'll just do nothing, right? So if you really think brain areas cannot adjust and cannot adapt, then you might predict, look, this part of the brain evolved for vision. It can't do vision, now it won't do anything. Um, that definitely has, we've known that that's not the case, um, you know, for 40 years, right? So the visual cortices of people who are blind are active during a variety of auditory and tactile tasks. Um, and uh, the question is, what are the functions that are done by the visual cortex? And one dominant idea is that the visual cortices um, preserve their fundamental functions, but switch modalities. So if they were doing fine-grained acuity in V1, then they might um, do fine-grained spatial discrimination, but now in tactile stimuli. Or if you're doing motion perception in area MT, then now you're gonna switch and do auditory motion perception. 
right? So the fundamental cognitive operation is preserved, but you switch from doing it in the visual modality to doing it, say, in the auditory modality. Um, and what I'm going to tell you today is that at least what we find is that that isn't really the case, right? That actually um, the visual cortices of people who are blind, rather than maintaining the same function and switching modality, are taking on higher cognitive operations. And I'm gonna talk about language and um, numerical cognition and executive function. Um, and the reason for this kind of um, reorganization and this kind of dramatic, um, what, I, what I think of as a change in function is the anatomy, right? So in, um, if you look at the brain of a mouse, um, probably some of you work with mice and know much more about um, mouse brains. This is a graph from Leia Kurbitzer. Um, there's a lot of sensory territory, right? There's a lot of territory taken up by visual cortex um, and somatosensory cortex and olfactory cortex, right? By contrast, if you look at the brain of a human, sensory cortices are kind of islands among a sea of higher cognitive representations that do language and number and executive control. And um, the connectivity between early sensory areas is um, either non-existent or very small, right? Depending on which um, two sensory areas you're looking at. Most of the um, top-down information or crosstalk between modalities is happening through um, executive areas and frontal and parietal cortices feeding back to the sensory systems and the sensory systems feeding back to these central systems. So the idea is when you remove the bottom up information that's coming into the visual system, what takes over is these higher cognitive systems because they're the ones who have connectivity to these areas in the first place. So that's the idea. Um, so the first um, piece of data that I want to show you from is from this kind of um, uh, cute paradigm <laughs> using naturalistic stimuli um, uh, that we did um, using auditory stimuli in people who are blind. So I don't know um, how many of you are familiar with this kind of paradigm. It's a um, kitchen sink approach um, to cognitive neuroscience where instead of designing a clever experiment, um, what you do is you throw lots of information at the subject, you give them a movie. Um, so in this case, we used auditory movies. Here I'm showing you a little scene from Harry Potter. And the idea is that while you're watching this movie, you're in engaging, um, uh, if it's auditory movie, your auditory system, your uh, motion perception, your language perception systems, um, your executive systems for constructing the stories um, and different people are engaging those systems in, diff in similar time courses, right? So even though you don't know exactly what's happening when in the movie, you can use the brain of one person as a model for the brains of the other people, right? So here, what you do is you take one subject and you look at activity in each voxel in that subject and you correlate it with the time course of activity in the other participants. Right. So it's a kind of a neural synchronization analysis. If the movie worked and the um, director did a good job, then a bunch of different um, for a bunch of different people, similar cortical areas are going to be doing the same thing at the same time if they're watching the same movie. So that's kind of the idea. Um, the interesting thing about this paradigm is that, of course, you can show people movies um, or give them um, complex auditory stimuli, but also you can take low level stimuli. So in this case, I'm showing you synchronization across um, 19 um, sighted subjects as they're listening to backward speech, which is a low level um, stimulus that doesn't mean anything, but has a lot of acoustic variation. And what happens um, then is that the auditory cortices are highly synchronized across people, but nothing else, right? So depending on the complexity of the stimulus, low level auditory stimuli will synchronize auditory ears because there's fluctuation in volume and frequency, but they won't um, synchronize higher cognitive regions. This by contrast is synchrony for the same group of people when they're listening to the auditory clips of movies. Right. So now you get synchrony in semantic areas and language areas and prefrontal cortices, presumably because these are engaged in similar higher cognitive operations across people. And so we use this paradigm to ask, 
what kind of thing are the visual cortices doing in people who are blind? Are they doing a low level auditory kind of function or are they doing a higher level cognitive kind of function? And um, so here are the data from different blind participants as they're, you know, they're undergoing fMRI while they're um, listening to these, um, to these movies. And what you can see is that in the case of the backward speech stimulus, which is a simple kind of non-meaningful stimulus, you get no synchrony in the visual cortex across people who are blind. But when you show the auditory movies, you get synchrony in something like 65% of the visual cortex um, in this population. So that provides us with a clue that what this area is doing is something to do with the high level properties of the stimulus and not just the low level properties. Um, Lisa Must, in collaboration with Janice Chen, also used this paradigm to show that patterns of activity in the visual cortices of people who are blind are sensitive to which segment of the movie the person is currently listening to. So um, this is an approach that uses multivariate patterns and breaks the movie up into 10 second chunks and asks whether segment one in person one is more similar to segment one in person two than segment two in person two or segment three in person two. And using this kind of strategy, you can find that in people who are blind, a bunch of visual cortices care not only about you know, that you're listening to a complex stimulus, but which segment of that stimulus you're currently listening to. So this gives us a clue that visual cortices are doing something contentful, right? Because patterns of activity in those, in those areas are seem to be representing the content of the movie, audio movie. So the good thing about the audio movies is that they're very engaging to the subjects um, and you can um, get kind of interesting information about similarity across people and multivariate patterns. But what you can't really do is learn very much about the cognitive content of the representations for the reason that there's lots going on in the same um, in the same stimulus. So here I'll show you some data from experiments where I think we can actually figure out well, what are some of the kinds of information visual cortices are sensitive to. This is a project that was done by Connor Lane a few some years ago now um, in the lab where he presented people who are blind with auditory sentences and asked them to um, answer um, questions, yes or no questions about who did what to whom. Um, and then in the control condition, participants hear lists of non-words like tease, narsal, rot, rot venterbal, pollard, right? So just lists of non-words. Um, and then they have to do a memory task with those lists of non-words. And then the sentences, there are two kinds. The dark red sentence is grammatically complex. It has a movement dependency. And the light red sentence is more simple, but they contain the same words and they mean nearly the same things. So we're manipulating whether the stimulus is language and also whether it's grammatically complex. Um, and what you find in people who are blind, but not people who are sighted, is that visual parts of the brain, including V1, so the kind of sort the part that does you know low level vision of people who are sighted, are responding more to sentences than to the non word control condition, even though both are sound and both sound speechy. Um, the other interesting thing is that these um, low level visual areas are sensitive to the grammatical complexity of the sentences, so they respond more to the grammatically complex sentences even when they mean approximately the same thing, right? So this suggests that these visual areas and people who are blind are becoming responsive to fine-grained linguistic information, and that's not the case in the blindfolded sighted subjects, okay? Um, there's also a correlation such that the larger the response to the grammatically complex sentences, um, the better the participants were at actually answering comprehension questions about these sentences in the scanner. Um, we were also interested in whether um, this may, does, does this extra brain territory involved in language processing actually make blind people better at the task? This question turns out to be really difficult to answer because um, it requires you know, invasive kinds of techniques, right? Or patient data, which we don't currently have. But one way we, we tried to go at it is to ask whether people who are um, born blind are on average better at answering comprehension questions about grammatically complex sentences. Um, so this is work by um, Rita Loyotile, Connor Lane, and Emily Silvano is currently doing um, a follow-up on this experiment. So participants now outside the scanner with a larger sample um, are doing the same kind of sentence comprehension question um, task, and they're answering questions about these sentences. And you're, um, the blind data are shown in blue, 
um, and the cited data are shown in the orange color. And so um, in addition to um, doing this grammaticality, sorry, this um, grammatically, co this comprehension task with grammatically complex sentences, which is shown over, um, over there, the complex um, sentences where we find that people who are blind are better than people who are sighted, right? So the blue bar is higher, meaning they're performing better at the questions. At the same time, we've tested these participants on a math task, on a vocabulary test, on a reading task, and on a bunch of other tasks that I'm not showing you here. So they're matched in a lot of other ways in addition to age and education. Um, so this suggests that there is um, blind people are better, whether it's really because of the brain activity, of course, we don't know from this kind of experiment. Um, so one question mm, that you might ask is, okay, the visual cortex in people who are blind is activating during language processing, but maybe there's something special about the relationship between vision and language, right? Maybe I thought vision was different from language, but maybe there's something in common. So for example, scenes can be hierarchical, right? There's like some hierarchical structure to the way scenes are organized. Likewise, sentences have hierarchical grammatical trees. Maybe there's something about the cognitive representations of these domains that's similar. But what we hypothesize is that this isn't because of some analogy between domains, but rather because of the connectivity between these higher cognitive regions, including language regions, and the visual system in humans. And so we looked for other cases where we might expect plasticity in the visual cortex for high cognitive functions. And so in this experiment, Shipra Congilia actually asked whether math, um, so solving math equations, which is in sighted people um, supported by a frontal parietal network, which we know has strong connectivity with, with the visual cortex, whether this kind of task also engages the visual system, maybe different parts of the visual system. Um, so in this experiment, participants um, solved math equations. Um, so they get two equations and they have to say whether the value of X is the same across the equations, or they get pairs of sentences and they have to say auditory always. They have to say whether they mean the same thing. And we're asking um, what neural circuits are being engaged by these tasks. So this is now saying what's more active for math than for sentences. And in sighted people, you get responses in parietal cortex, which is what you expect. And in blind people, you also get those frontal parietal responses, but additionally, you get a bunch of activation in the visual cortex, right? And so this suggests that not only are parts of the visual cortex engaged by language, they're also engaged by math. Um, and importantly, and interestingly, um, what Shipra showed is that the parts of the visual cortex that respond to math in blind participants, their activity increases as the math equations get harder, and the part, but those parts are different from the parts of the visual cortex that responds to language. And those areas are sensitive to grammatical complexity of sentences, but not the complexity of the math equations. So in the visual cortex of people who are blind, there also seems to be some specialization. It's not just like all a visual cortex is responding to any interesting auditory task. No, they're different regions and they're sensitive to the complexity of the stimulus. Um, this is the last one that I'll tell you about, which is a go-no-go -go auditory task. So the previous tasks I told you about are both symbolic, right? One is linguistic, one is mathematical. This is a non-symbolic, simple executive function task where um, it's a go-no-go -no -go task. So participants hear three different kinds of tones. Um, the most frequent tone, they just press one button. For the infrequent tone, they press another button. And then for the no-go tone, they withhold a button response. Um, and of course, in this kind of no-go task, which is going really fast, um, the withholding of the response is harder and participants make errors of commission. So in, they erroneously press the button. This is analogous to go-no tasks in mice, where I guess they lick for sugar and sometimes, or sugar water or whatever, and sometimes um, um, they erroneously lick, even though they're not supposed to, right? So in this case, the person is like pressing a button and they erroneously press the button. And that you see in both sighted and, and um, blind people. Interestingly, for the no-go trials, when you're doing nothing whatsoever, you're just lying in the scanner, not pressing a button, you get this large um, increase in activity in front of parietal systems, presumably to inhibit the response right? Um, these effects are right lateralized, which is different from what you see um, in language um, left lateralized responses. Sorry, did you have a question? Or yeah, did someone have a question? Yeah, there is a question on Zoom from uh, Jing Zhu. Um, Jing, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> 
if we don't hear you soon, I can ask it also. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I was just asking uh, the the previous uh, studies, uh, the two you mentioned, the blind people, are they blindfolded or um, uh, also, if not, the, is it possible that they just have some residual visual processing, uh, even though they are not aware or they claim they couldn't see the stimuli? Um, so in this, in these studies, the blind participants are blindfolded because Shipra Kanjilia, who did this research, insisted on doing so um, to match them to the sighted people. But these are people who have, um, in some cases, no eyes um, and no functioning retinas and can't, you know, navigate the world. So I don't think they, it, I don't think it's possible that they are, um, like, they, they are actually seeing it, but they but they say they're not. I think they're, oh. they know what they're <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, another question <laughs> is, are they congenital or are they, um, when, when did the blind happen? Um, yeah, so these data are from people who are born blind, but um, it's later on, I'll tell you if I have time a little bit about people who became blind as adults and the results are different in that population. That's a yeah, good question. okay, thank you so much, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, so people are doing this um, go, no, go task. Um, right, and so here are the data from a group of sighted people, a group of blind people, and the difference between the two groups um, where I'm showing you greater responses to the no go trials than the frequent go trials. Now remember, the frequent go trials are the trials where they're pressing a button, the no go trials are the trials where they're doing nothing, right? Um, and so what you find in sighted people is increased responses in prefrontal and frontal parietal cortices. We also get some effects in the temporal lobe, maybe because of the auditory nature of the task. Um, in blind people, again, you also get these frontal parietal responses, also right lateralized, but they extend into the occipital cortex. And then when you compare the two groups, you get larger responses in the blind than the sighted in a subregion of visual cortex. Um, yeah. And here I'm showing you region of interest data um, where I'm contrasting the responses in the sensory motor cortex um, versus the prefrontal cortex, right? So the red condition is the no-go trial where you're not doing anything. The light green condition is the infrequent go um, and the dark green condition is the frequent go. And you can see then the motor system, the two trials where you make any kind of motor response cause a larger effect, a larger response than the trial where you don't do anything. By contrast, in the prefrontal cortex, you get the largest response for the case where you're doing nothing. Um, and in the occipital cortex of blind people, you get this prefrontal-like pattern where you get larger responses to the no-go trials than to the frequent go trials, okay? Okay. So this is putting all those data together. So responses to math, responses to no-go um, selection and responses to language in a single sample of people who are blind um, who did all of the tasks. And you can see that they largely activate different subsets of the visual cortex, just reinforcing this point that I made earlier that different subsets of the visual system seem to be carved up by different higher cognitive functions. Why is that? Um, the, the answer is we don't know fully, but we hypothesize that it's to do with differential connectivity um, to these parts of the brain. Um, so far, we've only yet measured resting state correlations as a proxy for connectivity, but we find that, for example, um, language response of visual areas show higher correlations with language response of prefrontal areas, and math response of visual areas show higher correlations with math response of prefrontal areas in blind people. Um, these effects are subtly present in people who are sighted, but they're larger um, in people who are born blind. Um, the other interesting thing that I wanna tell you about with regard to the connectivity data, so sorry, I, I kind of didn't say much about it. So in these connectivity experiments, we're doing resting state scans, right? So participants go into the scanner and they just have to lie and relax um, and they're blindfolded during these scans. And then we can measure correlations between different brain areas. And previous studies have shown that areas that habitually coactivate, like the left motor cortex and the right motor cortex show high correlations inside of people, but areas that 
um, don't work together. So for example, the visual cortex um, and the um, auditory cortex show lower correlations than the visual cortex in other parts of the visual system, right? Similarly, different parts of the language system show high correlations with each other. Um, so this is just in resting state data in general, but we're using it to ask, how do resting state correlations reflect the functional reorganization of the visual cortex? So one of the things we have found and other people have found as well is this interesting pattern, which is that in people who are sighted, the visual cortices are most correlated with other visual areas, right? So if I look at V1, it's going to be correlated with secondary visual areas and the left V1 is going to be correlated with right V1. After that, in a sighted person, the um, other areas that are correlated with the visual cortex are other sensory motor networks. So the motor cortex, sens somatosensory cortex, and auditory cortex, right? Um, and prefrontal cortex, which is the higher cognitive areas, is less correlated um, with visual cortices in people who are sighted than other sensory regions. And the idea is, as a sighted person, you're habitually integrating information across modalities. So if someone throws me a ball and I have to catch it, then I have to look at it and then I have to you know, synchronize my motor control. If I hear a bird up um, in a tree and I look at it, that's auditory information being integrated with visual information. By so sensory systems um, habitually synchronize their function, which you can measure even at rest. Um, so what you what these circle plots show is that so up at the top of the circle plot is three different visual areas. Um, they're all secondary visual areas, but it actually doesn't. This is generalizes across visual cortices, um, and the purple lines are connectivity between these visual areas and S1, M1, and A1, right? So low level sensory areas and other modalities. And the green lines are connectivity with prefrontal cortices. And you can see that in people who are sighted, there's more um, correlation between visual areas and areas and other sensory modalities. By contrast, in people who are born blind, you see a reduction in correlations with other sensory areas of the visual cortex and an increase in correlations with prefrontal cortex. Okay, yeah. I, I, I was wondering in the blind So I was wondering in the blind population, is the activity in the visual cortex uh, uh, important for the different types of uh, cognitive processing, or is it just a readout of different areas? Yeah, so I think your question is a great one and one that people have puzzled over. There's some evidence um, from transcranial magnetic stimulation studies that um, this activity is behaviorally relevant. Um, so there's a classic study by Amir Ahmedi's group where they stimulated the occipital pole in people who are blind while they were asked to generate verbs to herd nouns. And they were able to induce errors in blind reader in, in blind speakers. There's also a couple of studies showing that you can impair braille reading by stimulating the occipital cortex in people who are blind. So there's some evidence um, for functional relevance, but um, there's many more fMRI studies than there are of these TMS studies because they're uh, pretty hard to do. But it, in the Braille case, there's at least a couple of studies um, that suggest behavioral relevance. So there's definitely evidence that it's not epiphenomenal, but it, but there's not there's not a lot of data. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Are you just not showing the functional connections between um, non-visual sensory areas and the PFC, or is there really no functional connectivity between? Uh, I'm just not showing it. Yeah, I'm not. So actually, the uh, incited people, the connectivity pattern um, is pretty analogous across sensory systems. So they all show this pattern. So that's true of the auditory cortex, it's true of the visual cortex, and it's true of the sensory motor cortex as well. However, because prefrontal cortex and sensory motor cortex are closer together anatomically, that correlation is a little bit higher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, did these correlations go from, I don't know some of these correlations, but they go from strongly negative, let's say to less negative or- No, from, these are all positive correlations. So they increase in positive, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this, yeah, I guess that's annoying that I'm, I, I think I have, I'm trying to think if I have, yeah, so here's a, 
Let me see if I can have something that, yeah, that maybe it's easier to see. Oh, no, it's not easier. Uh, no, it's, I, it's okay. I, these correlations, um, I always find them difficult to show. So I decided circle plots would be easier, but maybe they're, they, they're not. <laughs> maybe bars are better. These are the bars. Yeah, so they're positive. Um, so the, one of the things that we were wondering is um, what, how does this happen during development, right? So is it the case that your brain starts out like a sighted person, like a sighted adult with visual areas more correlated with other sensory motor areas? Um, and then what happens if you spend your early childhood as blind, then the brain shifts. It kind of decides, look, no, I have to work with prefrontal areas. The alternative is that you need visual input to establish this pattern, that the brain actually starts out like a blind brain when you're born and it's synchronous activity, for example, between sensory motor behavior and vision that establishes that increased connectivity. Um, and so among um, you, um, Tian, uh, um, who um, just started a job at Zhuhai University um, uh, in, um, in Zhuhai, <laughs> um, uh, was a postdoc in our lab, and this is what she spent doing during COVID, right, is analyzing um, developmental human connectome data from babies to try to understand what is the starting point. And um, so we, we're going to compare newborn infants who are about two weeks old, their resting state connectivity data to blind adults and sighted adults. And remarkably, for the secondary visual areas, which I'm showing you here, which are the ones that are um, that I was talking about that show cross-modal plasticity, the babies look more like blind people, right? So um, it's not the case that, at least in the case of these secondary visual areas, that the pattern is more like a sighted person. Um, rather, you need visual experience to establish this pattern of connectivity during development, which I think is quite cool. Now, of course, um, these are resting state correlations, which are changeable by experience. By contrast, anatomical connectivity is not being measured here and is probably very similar across groups. So these are functional changes rather than um, large scale anatomical changes. How am I doing on time? Uh, five minutes. Okay. So I think if I have five minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Braille. Oh, I guess I better tell you about. So one quick point since somebody asked a question about adult onset blindness is that we don't see the same kind of reorganization of people who become blind as adults. So you do see some cross-modal responses in people who are adult onset blind um, during auditory tasks, but they don't show this characteristic of um, uh, higher cognitive sensitivity. So these are data from the sentence processing task and the congenitally blind data are the tall bars, right? With the dark blue bar is the grammatically complex sentences. And what you can see is that in congenitally blind people, as I talked about before, there's this response to sentences and larger response to grammatically complex sentences. Um, but the adult onset blind people that's labeled AB, these are individuals who lost their vision, you know, at age 18 or later, um, they look on this task pretty much like sighted people. Importantly, they don't show these grammatical complexity effects. Um, and that's true for the math data as well. So the two cases where we've looked and other people have found this evidence um, suggest that these dramatic cases of reorganization where the brain really takes on these different, completely different functions are really constricted um, to, to development, to um, potentially critical periods. Okay, so now I wanna briefly tell you about um, how the brain adapts to Braille. Um, and you know, this is the remarkable thing about people is that, um, in the case of blindness, um, people create tools. They have canes, they use dogs, um, they use Braille. So Braille is a tactile reading system that was invented by a blind student um, in the 1800s based on a military communication code and kind of took over the world. Um, and you read Braille by passing your finger across raised dots. Um, and so one of the um, amazing things is that the brain gets is able to develop, um, we are able to develop these cultural tools that are adapted to our experience. And the question is, 
how, how do we implement this and what can that tell us about um, the plasticity of the brain um, and cultural recycling? Okay, so um, uh, Braille letters are comprised of six raised dots. For those of you who are not um, familiar, there are six possible positions where you could have um, a raised dot in, in, in Braille. Um, in uh, English Braille, there are different um, uh, symbols that stand for letters, but also for contractions. So for example, there's a single symbol for the contraction ER or FF, um, or for the wor word for, right? It has a single cell that stands for it, but then there's also a single cell that stands for D. There's also multi-cell um, contractions and single contractions. So the uh, Braille alphabet, um, in English is a combination of single letter symbols and also symbols that stand for multiple letters at once. Um, and now I just want to show you guys a video of what it looks like for a person who a proficient Braille reader um, to read Braille. So this woman is reading from Harry Potter, right? Um, um, I can tell you that if, when I have tried, I can't tell two letters apart, right? So this person is reading probably about 200 or maybe 250 words a minute. Um, if you ever try to distinguish two words in Braille, you will find that it's very difficult. So it's amazing, right? Something has to be, what, what makes this kind of skill possible? Um, and in sighted people, um, you know, visual reading is supported by this well-studied ventral stream system um, that seems to be specialized for representing characters and character combinations in the visual modality. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, sighted readers develop the so-called visual word form area in the ventral stream that is particularly sensitive to letters um, and letter combinations and words. Um, and this is a study showing some of that data. Um, and one idea in people um, who are blind Braille readers is that we use the same circuitry for reading Braille as sighted, um, that blind people use the same circuitry for reading Braille as sighted people use for reading visual print. Um, and there's indeed some evidence that the visual word form area is active during Braille reading um, in people who are congenitally blind. Um, but our idea was that, um, if uh, that the modality of the sensory symbol, um, because, because of the connectivity of the system, probably will influence uh, which circuits are actually engaged for reading. So what we actually predicted is that um, uh, parietal areas that are closer to somatosensory cortex might play a special role in braille reading that they don't play um, in visual reading. And then actually, although the visual word form area is active during braille reading in um, blind readers, it might not serve the same function because it's not getting its information from low level visual areas. Um, so to do this kind of work, we use um, a refreshable braille, um, MRI compatible refreshable braille display to present Braille stimuli to blind participants in the fMRI scanner. And we've done um, a couple of experiments now, and maybe I'll tell you just about a few of them. So this is now data um, of blind participants reading words, um, consonant strings, or control shapes, con um, control tactile shapes constructed of Braille dots. Um, and um, the sighted control participants are doing an analogous task, but instead of see, you know, doing it tactily, they're doing it visually. So they're getting words, consonant strings, or um, uh, false fonts, right? So visual shapes that look like letters, but are not letters. Um, and what you find um, is that in the ventral stream, for people who are blind, um, so people who are sighted develop this patchwork of areas, some of which seem to be specialized for words, but most of which actually respond to the control stimuli because these are visual regions and um, they respond more to unfamiliar visual stimuli, but then you get some islands like the visual word form area that specialize for, um, for visual words. In blind people, the whole ventral stream responds to words. So it's not organized in the same way as a sighted person. And we think it's actually probably responding to language. Perhaps, um, or, or somewhat more interestingly to me, 
what you can find is that um, parietal areas are more engaged during tactile reading than they are in visual reading. These are parietal circuits that are just posterior um, to sensory motor cortices that are more active during braille reading than, for example, when you're listening to words. Um, and that's true for tactile reading, but not true for visual reading. Um, we think that there is a gradient of representation going from low level sensory uh, motor areas to the occipital cortex, where the earlier areas are more responsive to shapes um, made out of braille dots. Whereas in at the further you go posterior, the more responsive it becomes to actual braille words. So while people who are sighted have a ventral stream, um, it looks um, in these data like people who are blind might have instead of having a, a stream that moves from the back of the brain anteriorly, it actually moves back into the occipital cortex. Um, I'm gonna skip that it's too um, long to explain. And th this is the last piece of data that I'll tell you about. So here we looked at the lateralization of responses to braille, depending on which hand was being used to read um, and depending on what hemisphere is specialized for language. So in people who are blind, actually there's a lot of variability um, in terms of language laterality. Um, and then there's also variability in which hand the person prefers to use when they're reading braille. And so what we found is that in um, sensory motor cortices, so um, the hand region of the sensory motor cortex, um, this, that's shown in this bar plot here, lateralization is driven by which hand you're using, which makes a lot of sense, right? So people who are reading with their right hand have right lateralized, um, left lateralized responses, people who are reading with their left hand have right lateralized responses, which is shown below. By contrast, if you go to Broca's area, um, hand doesn't matter anymore, right? And these parietal areas fall somewhere in between, um, as well as ventral occipitotemporal areas. What's shown above is the effect of language laterality, right? So it seems like the lateralization of responses to Braille is determined by two factors which hand you're, at least factors, which hand you're using to read, to read Braille, and then what parts of the brain are specialized for language. Is it your left hemisphere or your right hemisphere? And so in the sensory motor cortex, there's no relationship between language lateralization and the lateralization of responses. So there's no correlation between um, laterality of response in sensory motor cortex to Braille and spoken language. By contrast, if you go to Broca's area, um, you get a really strong correlation with language, but no effect of hand. And then the parietal cortices and the ventral occipital temporal cortices show this in-between pattern, but they show effects of both, um, of both factors. Okay, so, um, so just to conclude, I think the blindness case allows us to identify how the human brain adapts to differences in experience including um, learning braille, but also reusing visual cortices for non-visual functions. And um, I, one of the take-home messages is there's a lot of ways to use our cortex, right? Um, so there seems to be particularly during development, a lot of flexibility in terms of which areas, the, um, which functions cortical areas will take on. Um, we also can reuse the connectivity that we have, for example, the connectivity between parietal and occipital cortex for reading Braille in a way that it was never intended. So I think that's the cool stuff um, that you learn from working with people who are blind. And thank you so much for listening. And um, of course, thanks to my lab, first and foremost, who did all this work. This is our party during COVID. Um, and then thanks to the blind community and of course our funders. And thanks very much. Okay, we have time for maybe just one or two questions. Okay, I have a question. Uh, so for the functional connectivity results, um, do you think that there's some preferential sort of routes that um, get built into the system um, over development for, for the blind individuals or I guess for the science individuals? Um, or do you think it's more of a, you know, when, when two regions sort of 
are doing the same task, they may be just cultivated at the same time, even if there's no direct link between them. Yeah. Um, you may still be able to get correlations, um, even if they don't really talk to each other any more than, than otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're, you're, maybe there's multiple questions inside your question, right? So one um, might have to do with the relationship between anatomy and function, and the other one is what do functional connectivity coactivations mean, right? So first of all, um, there isn't a lot of evidence of in new connections being formed, anatomical new connections being formed in humans, right? Which would make sense. Very large brains, quite developed at birth. So I wouldn't expect like a new tract, for example, from visual cortex to prefrontal cortex. So surely, the, and also there's no evidence for that happening. And people who are blind, they're, you know, DTI data are not that great, right? For, yeah, so, so we might be missing something, but there's certainly more change in the resting state patterns than there is in the anatomy. Um, so I think whatever changes we're observing are certainly functional changes, right? Um, rather than like track, new tracts being formed. Um, the other part of your question is something like what, I mean, yeah. So, so the, the data that we have is that in people who are blind, um, visual areas are engaged during math tasks and during language tasks and during executive tasks, right? Um, these same brain areas are enhance their connectivity with matching prefrontal areas, right? So, um, so I guess what's the, I, I don't know, we don't know whether they have a direct anatomical connection, but it seems like both in the task-based manner, they're assuming analogous functions. And in the resting state data, they're becoming more correlated. So I guess, what, so what's the alternative explanation? Yeah, I mean, that made sense to me. <clears throat> Maybe the two of us can, can chat more afterwards. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, let's thank oh, Marina. Thank you. Oh, okay. I got a crazy comment. Okay, great. <laughs> So if you flip this on this head, I, I really love this thing. What you're saying is something about development of the prefrontal cortex mm. as the lack of yeah. sensory input is really what is hardening for lack of a better term. So what the hell do you think is going on? Yeah, that, that's I mean, what, it's a crazy yeah. comment. Yeah, 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 no, I think there are multiple things going on because actually, and it's this part might be easier to see in the bar graph. Um, so what you can see is that two things are happening. If you compare the sighted adults to the blind or the babies, right? This bar is lower and this bar is higher, right? So it seems like the visual cortex is um, less correlated with other sensory motor areas and more correlated with prefrontal cortex. So one part of it could be about prefrontal cortex, which of course is like very late developing. Um, yeah, so it could be for that related to that uh, reason. The weird thing is that it's the correlation is higher with prefrontal cortex in infants, right? Um, the other part is, um, with sensory motor and between sensory motor and visual areas. So that can't have to do with prefrontal cortex. Um, I mean, our, our current going hypothesis is that you need a synchronized visual motor experience, visual auditory experience to enhance these correlations. But we really, we don't know, can I, right? Can I yeah. give you one suggestion yes, that you don't want to do? Yeah. <laughs> I'd be curious to look at the thalamus, what happens to the visual component in the thalamus, how's that switching? Yeah, right. I mean, that's a very interesting question and has gotten a lot of, there's a lot of really good animal research um, on that topic. And if, I mean, pro probably you know <laughs> about it, that there's been um, some effort to distinguish a cortical effects, yeah. thalamic effects, and, and, and so on. Um, there's less work um, on the thalamus in humans because it's small and difficult to image, but um, we, we early on, um, when we were doing this work, one of the things that we found is that the middle, I think it's the medial geniculate nucleus, like a higher um, order cognitive nucleus was of the thalamus was getting also synchronized to some degree with um, uh, 
um, with visual areas, but we didn't see synchrony with auditory nuclei per se. There's some, there's a lot of debate about this particular topic, like the degree to which there might be change thalamically in, you know, in addition to, or the causal role that it plays. So I, I think the going thought is that that would require more rewiring because it's a lower level structure. Um, and so it, since there's not a lot of evidence for it, the current thought is like, it's a less likely possibility, but um, I, th I think honestly, we, we, what we know is quite limited. Yeah. 